Welcome to the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast for club owners, operators, and fitness professionals. Each week, host Brian O'Rourke brings you an expert interview with a global influencer at the crossroads of fitness and technology. You gain the insights, tools, and inspiration you need to stay connected to the pulse for what matters most for your business in the age of exponential technologies. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast. I'm your host, Brian O'Rourke, and thanks for joining us today. Have you been to IHRSA, I-H-R-S-A, the International Health Rock and Sports Club Association's international conference before? Well, if you have, or if you have not, please note that this year it is in wonderful San Diego, running from March 21st through the 24th. And I will have the uh, fortunate opportunity to be able to present on the 24th on that Saturday. So I hope you will join me uh, where I talk about now what? The present and future of the health club industry. And so today on the podcast, we're actually going to be sharing my talk from last year's URSA, uh, which was in the LA area, Poised for Expansion, the Future of the Fitness Industry. 300% growth in the next 10 years. And you can buy the video of this presentation from the IHRSA store. That's IHRSAstore.com. You can look at Poised for Expansion. Look it up. Look up my name, Brian O'Rourke. And there you can buy it. You can see the video. Download it uh, if you're interested. We also have the deck available on SlideShare, uh, which is connected to our Fit Technology council.org website, so check it out. But in this upcoming presentation, which I hope you enjoy, we're going to talk about key trends that are impacting the industry and laying the groundwork for 300% growth um, in the near future for the industry space. We're going to touch on consumer trends, technology trends, economic trends, and globalism, and how those things are going to converge to create a much larger marketplace than we have today. And so I really hope you enjoy this talk and hope to see you at IHRSA this year in San Diego, March 21st through 24th. So without further ado, here's the speech. Thanks so much. Once upon a time, business as usual was often good enough. No more. Where we are going, good enough is dead. In a world where everything is connected, where everything is equally excellent, where performance is reaching perfection, there's only one space left to innovate in. You. Right now, you are a central point in the raging tornado of change fueled by digitization, mobilization, augmentation, disintermediation, automation. Well, the list goes on. Science fiction is becoming science fact. Think about self-driving cars or computers that can learn and think. The way we work will never be the same. The skills we need will be dramatically different. Winning or losing are now happening faster than ever before. So what's your response? How will you discover new opportunities in one of the most transformational times in human history? Are you driving change? Or are you being driven by it? Disruption has become the new normal. With change, it's always gradually, then suddenly, well, things really have stopped happening gradually. This change is exponential. Everything that used to be dumb and disconnected is now wired and intelligent. Cars, cities, ports, farms, even our bodies will be wired with sensors and will talk to each other. These game changers are also combinatorial. They amplify each other, creating a perfect storm of change. Quantum computing fuels big data. The Internet of Things fuels artificial intelligence and deep learning, which fuels robotics. However, anything that cannot be digitized or automated will become extremely valuable. Human-only traits such as creativity, imagination, intuition, emotion and ethics will be even more important in the future because machines are very good at simulating 
but not at being. Yes, robots and software will do some of our work, but this will allow us to focus on things that cannot be automated. To imagine change squared, you've got to start engaging more with what might be, not just with what is. Immerse yourself in the immediate future, five to seven years out from today. We need to go beyond technology and data to reach human insights and wisdom. Technology represents the how of change, but humans represent the why. The future is about holistic business model. The opportunity is to be liquid, to learn just in time, not just in case, not single improvements, but complete transformations, not individual systems, but new ecosystems. Humanity is where true and lasting value is created. We will engage, relate, and buy things because of the experiences they provide, because of their transformative power. The future doesn't just happen, the future gets happened. The new way to work is to embrace technology, but not to become it. The future is in technology, yet the bigger future lies in transcending it. Let's live and lead from here. All right, let's hear it for Ursa 2017. Let's give it a round of applause. I am pumped. Great to have you all here. And uh, really, personal regards to very uh, close friends and esteemed colleagues who went out of their way to schedule an hours of time to hear what they've already heard from me before, probably. But I'm very happy to have you all here. The content you'll see today, I share freely on uh, my networks. So don't be shy. Uh, reach out, and uh, this content deck will be posted uh, shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in a time that is the greatest time you could ever be in this industry that we love. The potential is so massive that is ahead of us. As the video showed, though, business as usual is dead. It's RIP. It's over with. And the question we all must ask ourselves is how do we respond? How do we respond? And this is a very personal question for me because of my history, my very fortunate history. When I left university in the early 80s and studied finance, I had the benefit of the emergence of this tool. You know what that is, I assume. It had something in it called spreadsheets, things like Lotus 1, 2, 3. And what it enabled me to do is very quickly, at a very young age, outwork people, dozens of people with calculators and pads and pencils, calculating numbers that took me matters of hours to do the equivalent. And I worked for a very successful entrepreneur in New Orleans by Al Copeland, is his name on the right, in the fried chicken business of all things. <laughs> Uh, life is not often without a sense of irony, is it? Is it not? So, as a young man, I became the chief financial officer of a company at 24 and a half, 25 years of age. And that's because I knew how to apply technology as a tool in business endeavors. And that gave me great advantage. We took that company public and grew it to over a billion dollars. And then I left there after nine years and went on to grow a number of global brands, all applying technology ahead of the curve, all around innovating ahead of the curve. Smoothie King, we invented uh, the new kind of Vitamix blenders and the new point of sale systems for customer experience. When I uh, headed up and owned a coffee chain in New Orleans and grew it regionally, we were the first to adopt super automated espresso machines to help line speed, all innovation around tech. When Marine was the chief financial officer at Franco's Athletic Club, she applied systems similarly. We used what we learned in retail to begin consulting in the health club industry, applying psychographics to site cases and feasibilities, things that were technology applications that enabled people to do things with more insight than what they were used to. And finally, when we really got involved in the fitness space even more with our dear friend and partner Robert, 
in 2005 with Fitmark, people didn't know what the cloud was really at the time. You had to really be uh, somebody in the know to know what the cloud was in 2005. We adopted Salesforce.com. We automated our enterprise and our business processes using cloud technologies. It gave us great advantages. And at the same time, approximately a decade ago, I started really working on social networks. And let me tell you something. It was not without ridicule. A lot of people made fun of me over the fact that I spent so much time on networks. And at the time, if I had asked people to raise their hand and tell me how many of them uh, were going to be on Facebook or Twitter, they kind of looked at you with confusion in their eyes or a bit of kind of uh, a novelty of what a silly thing to be doing. Uh, yet it was a part and parcel of our future. Now people send emojis to each other like it's nothing. And at, back at that time when Twitter was uh, so nascent, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, who's a, a very widely known guy now, has his own venture capital firm, very, very successful guy, he made this video for me, uh, and this was seven and a half, eight years ago, about what was happening at that time. Thanks, Brian, for sending it over to me. Listen, Brian O'Rourke really knows what he's talking about. You know, he, his understanding of the fact that, we're, that leaders and CEOs are not getting involved in the social space and engaging and understanding the opportunity of the end consumer makes a ton of sense to me. I'm just baffled by people's lack of understanding on what's going on out there right now and how the consumer's shifting very quickly about where they're spending their time and where they're not. I have a book here, newspaper. Um, and so, you know, for me, bringing that value of that social conversation and really those thank you economy principles, whether it's fitness centers or, or trainers, generally the fitness space, there's an enormous opportunity to engage on the social level, on the Facebooks and Twitters and Pinterests and Instagrams of the world and really drive end business results. Listen, I'm not Mother Teresa. I'm not a technologist. I'm not doing this because it feels nice. I'm not doing this because I love tech. I'm doing this because tangible business results are being driven from the enormous innovation that's happening in our society and that's affecting not only the fitness world but the entire world. So give it some thought um, because uh, innovation will run you over and uh, you won't get back up. And really at the time, um, something was happening that Thomas Friedman has written about recently. And that thing that was happening during the year that the iPhone was first released is this new era of super acceleration, the age of acceleration. Now today I'm going to share a couple of books. And believe me when I tell you, this is an important audience. If you're on Twitter, tweet me and Thomas. I will DM you, I will send you a copy of this book for free. It's worth a read. And Thomas Friedman speaks about this in very elegant terms. Thank you for being late. He documents very well in this book how much has changed and how quickly it is changing. And so it's always important to try and stay ahead of the curve. And now with my partnership in Goals Gym, we're starting to apply the same thinking. What is going to happen three to five years out? When I talk about your response, your response needs to always be thinking three to five years out. And I'll get into more detail on that later. And we continue to do that. You know, where social networks, we're on all of them now. Now we're doing podcast content. We're constantly experimenting, constantly uh, doing new things to learn all the time. This is the new norm. So if your business intends to grow, you must become in the habit, in the age of acceleration, to constantly apply new thinking, to constantly be trying to be ahead of the curve. And the opportunity for this is we believe the industry space, the one that exists now, and others from the outside who are going to come in, I'll explain that later, are going to dr grow the global space by over 300% by 2025 in serve members, both digitally and physically. And we believe, hence the name of our equity firm, Videre, in uh, Leonardo da Vinci's saying, Sapere Videre, which is to know is to see. You can't wait till the evidence is in front of your face. You need to have faith to understand what is coming to prepare it for it before it appears. Rising tides will lift all boats. 
But in the age of acceleration, where every industry, space, and business is being disrupted, you have to change your thinking to be prepared to deal with both the risk and the huge opportunities. Unimagined opportunities, unintended consequences. You have to invest. You have to shift your mind. This is the new norm in the disruption in the era of mass acceleration. This is what we're living in. So restaurants provide dining experiences. And now so does Blue Apron. So does Grubhub. Banks provide financial services. So do AIs and apps. The most sophisticated financial services and advice that was limited to the wealthy few are now available to the masses. Music experiences through concerts are now offered up this way. Medical care, okay, is offered up this way, all right? And here we are in our industry space offering health and fitness experiences. So is this, and so is this. You now have a nutritionist in your pocket measuring everything down to the number of calories, nutritional benefits for six million different food types. We also have experiences like these communities. We also have these experiences like these new apps. So not only that, not only pure digital services and fitness, now we're looking at changing the whole physical space. So you know of immersive products that are out in the marketplace, Les Mills and others, and you see now embedding screens, which we're going to get into, in physical spaces the size of this room. And the lines in industries are starting to blur increasingly. If you think of the fact that Toyota, the most valuable automobile company in the world in 2016, now has to contend with driving services like Lyft as a competitor. They never would have anticipated that a number of years ago. So all industries are experiencing these blurring lines. And we have to start asking ourselves questions. What are, as a result, fitness experiences truly becoming? How will the industry evolve? What will customers truly want? Okay, so while we're meeting people in the health club and fitness industry for their needs, we also have to be prepared for what's here today, which is Industry 4.0. This new realm of possibility that wasn't even possible to think about 48 months ago. And I'm going to show you plenty of examples of what that entails. One in particular, when we think about our business models, is the front desk itself, right? Key functions for health clubs that will be completely replaced in certain business models. This is the new era. That's Industry 4.0. And yes, that will be impacting our industry space. So this disruption is being created by the convergence of four key factors. We're going to touch all, on all of them. Number one is changing consumers, dizzying diversity. Our, our culture is youthified. The behaviors of the number one category of selfie takers on Instagram, 47-year-old females, is replicating what 27-year-old women were doing 20 years ago. You can go on Instagram and look at 80-year-old bodybuilders. Okay? Dizzying diversity. Everything we thought, all the labels in our head about belief in who our customers are, a lot of it is bogus, okay? It comes from thinking in the past that doesn't apply anymore. We've got to stop labeling people in our head and how we're marketing and how we're providing service because we bring too much bias to the table oftentimes. So something that has been on my mind and I wanted to make a quick video about is I've been reading so many of the comments on social networks about these teenagers, these kids. They don't get it. They're always on their phone. I, you know, I'm blown away by the establishment, uh, by parents, by the market, by the elders, and even by some of the kids within the age demo of the gross underestimation of this 11 to 16 year old, this 10 to 19 year old demo. What world do you think they're gonna be living in in 2025. And so all these critiques you have about what they're doing and they're not socially this and they're not good enough and they don't work hard enough, I don't know what you're paying attention to. Watching these kids grind and hustle and create content and ideas and businesses in these social networks, why don't you shut the fuck up and go to Instagram for three hours and stop judging and pay attention to the explosion of this creative hustler class that is the teenagers and the dominant leaders of our future. I love Gary because he speaks from the heart, but there's, a, there's some truth. <laughs> Sorry for that. 
there, are, there is a truth to what he's saying. And it examples me. So um, I'm not a millennial, but I score on a pew. I score a very pure millennial. Actually, now I score as a Gen Z. I'm 53. I score of a mentality of a 21-year-old. That isn't that I'm 21. It's that because of tech, because of a lot of things, because of the level of learning, because of my experiences, you can't label it anymore. Boomers, same thing. You can't label them anymore. Today in the U.S., more men are willing to change their careers for the benefit of family than our females. That's the kind of baggage we got to get rid of in our thinking about consumers. Another thing, I'd, I'd skip that over. We also see the mass affluence and, and also the kind of bifurcation trend amongst consumers. Our son, the old, our oldest son is 32. He uh, doesn't own a car, really. He just got a junky car, but he never owned a car. I mean, he doesn't care about these things. It, uh, so a lot of things I'm biased in believing. When I was 30-something, if I didn't have a car, I would have been apoplectic. You know, I would have gone crazy. The buying behaviors and thinking of people have shifted, and the way they're shifting and spending their money with their disposable income is radically different. Urbanization, more and more people are in cities. That's affecting behavior by consumers significantly. Of course, digitization, the fact that consumers have increasing power, even to the point that luxury goods now being procured at 10% of the market will easily be 40 in the next three years. People are buying automobiles, luxury automobiles, using apps. That would have never been possible if you thought about it five years ago. They don't care anymore, and they're highly influential. They trust doing things digitally. In fitness in particular, there are three significant trends, many of these trends you're familiar with, that are driving consumers today. Personalization, examples being beneficial intelligence and omnipresence. Engagement, which people use to flaunt their culture as a marketing tool and build status around identity with brands. And service, definition, redefinition, remixing product and service delivery. Examples are perspective shift and not just fitness. I'll show you some uh, specifics around personalization. Of course, Barry's uh, boot camp. They have personalization in that the smoothie that you love can be delivered at the fuel bar right when you get out of your class automatically. That's personalization. Under Armour with their record app, which not only collects data on your health, but it compares it to cohorts. So if I'm 53 and work out, it's going to tell me if I slept another hour, I'd probably perform 10% better. These are examples of personalization. Omnipresence, the number one guru brand in the space is SoulCycle. I'll tell you more about that later. They are very deft at integration and executing omnipresence for their delivery system. Omnipresence means experiencing the fitness experience both inside and outside clubs seamlessly without any friction. That's a big challenge for legacy operators who operate in siloed systems where the data can't easily flow. So eliminating that friction becomes very challenging. Engagement. People do business with companies because they see it as an extension of themselves. Brand affiliation, transactional affiliation, is driven by that. So engagement is becoming more and more relevant as a key marketing tool. Status is an example of that, both from leaderboards to you know, the coins and badges you get to all these different ways that people give status now using digital. And of course, technology isn't the only way to engage. You know, humans are still the best engagers in the world. And I'm going to show you a little bit more about that later and how important that is in the context of, of industry and brand execution. Another thing around engagement, which is about the heart, is taking that engagement, that personal identification, and flaunting that culture as a strategic tool of showing people what defines you and enabling your customers to connect with you. We know some of these brands and how they do it very well. Service definition and redefinition, which I call it, is perspective shift. So the things that we've done in fitness for many, many years, we're just taking and remixing a little bit, changing it up. Virtual group classes are nothing new. They're group classes. They're just presented in a different way so people can find it easier to consume it. As we're, when we go through Kevin Kelly's book, The, 12, uh, the Inevitable, The 12 uh, New Innovations in Technology, we'll talk about remixing being a key to the future. It's a perspective shift. You don't have to be physically in front of a fitness professional to obtain physical training, just like you don't have to be physically in front of a doctor to obtain medical care. 
It's the same thing. It's just being different, delivered in a different way. And not just fitness. Because of Industry 4.0, things like nutrition, things like specialized DNA analysis to give you great personalized advice become very scalable. These are things that have challenged the fitness space for a long time. How do we do this? Well, now, with cyber physical systems, we can start actually doing this. When you look at what Blue Apron does, when you look at all these other products and services. So this is driving fitness consumer trends. The next thing is, of course, technology. Often misunderstood, and as the video in the beginning outlined, we cannot be defined by technology. We must use it and transcend it, okay, to where it's like the air we breathe. It's there, but we don't even know it. That's how you really leverage technology. E.O. Wilson, the foremost expert on ants in the world, you should read his book, Consilience. Fascinating stuff. Do you know ants send their old to battle so their young can survive? They're very interesting. He had this thing to say about technology in humans. We have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. Technology and humanity are not at odds. Technology is but a tool that, in fact, can evoke the best of humanity, can do the best to improve engagement and deliver sincere care, love, true engagement. This book is a great book. I really recommend you get it, and I'm offering to give it to you for free if you just tweet Kevin and I, uh, The Inevitable. He talks about this next 20 to 30 years. It's very relevant to our industry, even what's going to happen in the next 5 to 10. He says, and I agree, the greatest products and services in our industry space have not been invented yet. And there, today, there are young people in the world out there now who have it in them. They're just waiting for the technology that we're bringing to the surface to unleash their genius upon our space. So his 12 inevitables, we'll touch on a few of them. We don't have enough time. Becoming, cognifying, which is intelligence, flowing, the free flow of data, screening, I'll show you, accessing, cloud technology, sharing. Sharing is going to be the new capital. Uh, value is going to be in sharing, giving first. And we see it in the health club industry, screens. It's only going to become more and more prevalent in the physical health club experience is screens. Digitization screens delivering experience. We see it everywhere. We see accessing and cognification coming together. There are hundreds of Alexa skills now that are in fitness and meditation that are available via Alexa. Alexa, uh, schedule my trainer. Alexa, what is my caloric burn rate today? Alexa, what should I be doing tomorrow? And then Alexa's going to start telling you before you ask it. This is the reality that we live in in Industry 4.0. He goes on with another six, filtering, remixing, interacting, tracking, questioning. The value of questions is way more valuable now than answers in an era where we have Google. I always laugh at people who call me for advice, and I tell them I got a secret for you. What is that? I'll tell you. Get your pencil out. G O. O-G-L-E. Look it up. What are you calling me for? So, and beginning. We're constantly beginning in this new era of cyber-physical systems. And it's very inspiring as to what the possibilities and unintended consequences that will come of this. Let's talk about economics now. So one of the things that digitization is doing in business models, as we see convergence creating this disruption, is this reinvention of delivery systems, the long tail. Where in before, if you were in a certain industry space like health clubs, you did a certain number of things a certain way. Now, there's infinite number of ways to do things and many different kind of niche models that you can bring to market. Being very different, but all being successful in their own right. We're seeing this in all industry spaces. And we see with guru brands like SoulCycle, new delivery systems with what they've done, with the way they eloquently integrate their app and what they did before, and there's more to come. Now, from an economic perspective, we've seen the expansion of studios and low price model budget models as being the primary driver in the recent past. And when you look at the DuPont formula on how economics is driving the industry space in bricks and mortar, we see boutiques, the Guru brand of SoulCycle, generating between 53, 53 cents on the dollar on margin on revenue and generating, depending on asset turnover, one to three times returns 
Those are outstanding returns. That's why capital is being attracted to that segment. Similarly, with budget models, we see many franchisees in the planet system that are operating well, returning their capital in six to nine months with leverage. We see ranges of asset turnover, but you could see general ROA uh, you know, going up to two to 300 percent in some cases. That's why expansion of those, those particular segments has been so rapid the last number of years. We've also witnessed that technology continues to be a driver of not only dropping costs in the future, which it will, but also an enabler to generating increasing amount of revenue per customer. We define the market space globally as in eight segments. The high and full service, which we do not see much growth in. Equinox has stopped the majority of its rapid growth. They're shifting to hotels. They've diversified into Blink. They've diversified into SoulCycle's ownership. We see the middle market continuing to erode and redefine itself. We see the low price models expanding and continuing to span. We see, of course, boutiques continuing to do well. Our friends at Orange Theory, SoulCycle, Berries, all of those. And we see another four key models that are going to really expand dramatically. Lifestyle brands like Nike and Under Armour and others will come into our space. They're already starting to do it because they can monetize our customers better. That is going to help the industry grow. Pure digital plays will be a huge expansion area. Everything from Daily Burn to Peloton and other streaming and other interactive platforms, gamification platforms. We see medical integration being huge around the aging population as technology continues to advance in the application of primary prevention and technology exercise and other things for rehabilitation, et cetera, and longevity, and alternative models. So multifamily dwellings, specific applications in very specific vertical markets, be it a unique boutique in a subway location or, you know, or what have you uh, in a multifamily development. What's going to happen, no doubt, overall, is digital will be a key trend on business model transformation in all those segments. It's called being frictionless. Why should I have to fill out a lot of paperwork to have Lindsay train me today or to go do something with a club or to get my smoothie? Why should I have to even think about that? Why shouldn't I have an ecosystem where whatever I want, I can get it. It's monetized automatically. This is the new normal that's coming. And the way we think about creating value in industries overall is shifting from the old school thinking of value being driven by customers and transactions, where we see companies like Walmart, the largest in the world at what they do, and Toyota, changing to this dynamic, which is receptors and cognition. It's collection of data, learning around it, and creation of value. And this is a big challenge for legacy operators to try to go through the digital transformation process. But the good news from an economic perspective is we're going to have a lot of customers. <laughs> Because we know exercise is medicine, we know all the very great applications of what we do to the world at large, so there are a lot of people that need to use our product, and they will. We're just going to have to meet them where the market demands we meet them. And as people go through these experiences in other industry spaces and experience what I'm showing you, the level of expectation that they have is going to rise. And this is where the industry is now, S-curve reinvention. I'll talk to you a little bit about your response as we wrap up this. But we're going through a maturation process that is now being redefined with a bunch of new delivery systems and business models, some of which we haven't even imagined yet. Finally, we'll touch briefly on globalism. This is a very important factor, I'll explain. So 100,000 years ago, there were six types of humans on the planet. Homo sapiens, uh, sapiens they jumped out. Okay, Homo sapiens. The reason was because they were able to cooperate in large groups. That's what separated us from everyone else that was around at the time. And this is going to become more paramount than ever for our industry overall from a sustainability standpoint, a coordination on public policy, and it's why URSA is so important, along with other leading global bodies, be it Fitness Australia, be it Europe Active, be it whoever it is, because public policy is very, very important. And more than that, it's about what's being invented in China, which only has a 0.4% penetration rate. By the way, we tell you, they were actually using robots in clubs in China to advertise their services in malls while we were there. Uh, if China's market became equal in penetration to the U.S., they would be larger than the entire global health club industry combined. 
And what's going to be great about globalization is there are going to be inventions of new business models because of the leapfrog effect in those countries that are emerging that will ultimately drive innovation in this market here. So globalism is very important. So finally, we'll wrap up quickly. How will you respond? How will you respond to this era of acceleration? Well, you have to, pretty straightforward. You need to ask yourself a lot of objective questions about where you are and where you want to go. You need to realize that these are the four key drivers right now that every fitness business model needs to be evaluating. Aesthetics and design, both digitally and physically, are key for experience. Figuring out your business model to optimize profitability and sustainability. User experience, especially around omnipresence and how you do that. And finally, service scope. Secondly, attending events like URSA, listening to the Fitness Industry Technology Council podcast, following people like Rasmus and others in the room, listening and learning, getting tools and resources to evaluate what you should be doing, applying these adoption of, of thinking for S-curve reinvention to your own business, and get yourself a forward-looking plan that's three to five years out. So in case you missed it, we're poised for growth. The key is to seize the upside of this disruption, which is absolutely irrefutable. Apply Leonardo da Vinci's thought that to know is to see. Don't wait for it to show up on your doorstep. Get ahead of it. These four things are converging to drive that disruption. The good news is the greatest products and services for our industry space have not been invented yet. And if we work together as a team around the world, like URSA does, with people around the world and learn from each other, we can really take uh, this up another, uh, another notch and benefit from that uh, adoption of, of disruption and, and rising above it and beyond it. These are very true words. I believe them. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I hope you had an awesome time. Thanks for being here. Let's give it up. Hi, everyone. This is Brian O'Rourke again. Thanks for listening to the podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. The podcast is brought to you by the Fitness Industry Technology Council, as well as my company, Videri Ventures, Moon Mission Media, and others. We hope you enjoyed the content. Please feel free to share it and join us again soon when we bring to you another leader in the fitness space talking about technology and what it means to our industry. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you again very soon.